Good morning. I think that's the first time I've ever been compared to David Beckham. <laughs> so thank you for making time uh, to listen to my talk today. And before I get to um, what I'm sure is the most interesting topic to you, the, the creation of PlayStation 4, I'd like to tell you a little bit about my experiences before I started working at Sony Computer Entertainment. To put it briefly, um, I've been making games professionally for 31 years, starting in the arcades and then moving to the consumer side of the business. I'm bilingual. The other language that I speak is Japanese. And I'm married to a very nice lady. We'll be celebrating our 25th anniversary next year. Now, something unusual about my background is even though I've worked on over 30 games over the years, they've all been first-party titles or close to being first-party titles. None of the games here are multi-platform. And also, I've always been attracted to the extreme high-tech end of the business. If, if you go back enough years, uh, these games don't seem particularly high-tech. They look quaint. But that's just a testament to how rapidly technology evolves over time. It's particularly staggering to think about how much technology has changed since 1964, the year I was born. That's basically a 50-year span. Uh, the hot new technology in the United States that year was the color television. Uh, only one in 30 households had one. And we were ahead of the rest of the world. Uh, in the Europe and the UK, there were no color televisions and there was no broadcasting in color at all at that time. I was also born at a time before commercial video games. Uh, commercial video games didn't appear until 1971 in the form of Pong. And to be honest, I wasn't particularly attracted to the early arcade and home games. There just wasn't enough depth there for me. And so I ended up spending a lot more time with paper RPGs, uh, such as the original Dungeons and Dragons. And I'd also been programming quite a bit, not on home computers. In, in 1978, for example, less than a percent of households had a home computer, and they would have cost more than annual tuition at a nice private school. Instead, I'd been using the mini computers at the, the local science museum and the nearby university. And it occurred to me that a lot of what we did in paper RPGs, uh, roll dice, uh, take damage, would be so much easier to do on a computer. So I set out with my brother uh, to build a real-time, story-driven 20-hour RPG in 1978. And we weren't satisfied with the kind of graphics you ultimately saw in Ultima or Wizardry. We wanted to create a full 3D adventure with these virtual worlds rendered from the player's perspective. Now, needless to say, this was uh, pretty ambitious. We were writing our code on punched cards and displaying images on a scope. And we never did get the game done. But we were finally able to see the game that we were trying to build many years later. It was called Final Fantasy VII. And it just took uh, a staff of over several dozen professionals five years to make. Now, my second hobby in my teenage years was playing arcade games. After a number of years, the graphics and the level of fantasy had advanced enough that they really started being appealing to me. So beginning with Space Invaders, I became a, a serious arcade game player, Asteroids, Tempest, Defender, and the like. And about this time, I entered the university, becoming a full-time student at the age of 16. That's two years younger than is usual in the United States. I focused on math and, and physics, but to be honest, my studies weren't all that interesting for me. So I started looking for a way to turn my two hobbies into a job. And those hobbies were, were programming and playing video games. So I interviewed at a few local game companies. And at the age of just 17 years old, uh, I got a job at Atari's coin-operated game division. And this was very unusual even for them. I was the youngest employee at Atari by five years. But they were in a, a take a chance mode and something about having this child prodigy programmer gamer on the staff really appealed to them. Now, making arcade games in 1982 at Atari was definitely challenging. Most of these games were created by just one person. You had to be the designer, the programmer, and you usually had to make your own artwork as well. You simply had to be a jack of all trades. And none of us had any prior experience making video games. How could we? This was the dawn of the industry. So consequently, the failure rate of first titles by any game creator was about 100%. The arcade game business was also unusual in that there was essentially no marketing we did for the games. Marketing just didn't work in this environment. The players could see the games for free and, and try them for a quarter. And if that first experience wasn't fun, then they would never play that game again. So when your game failed, there really weren't any excuses you could make. That game was pretty much your personal creation, and the players had judged it directly and found it lacking. 
Now, there were a few people at Atari, such as Ed Logg or Dave Toyer, who'd figured out how to make a top-selling arcade game. These were, these were my personal heroes, the creators or co-creators of games such as Missile Command or Tempest. Um, it was great to talk to them, but unfortunately, the skills that they used in creating hit titles weren't something they could easily communicate. So we each had to puzzle out how to make successful games on our own. We were also, uh, at the time, struggling with the market crash. The arcade games business was in tremendous financial difficulty. The sales of coin-operated arcade games had actually hit their peak in the year before I joined Atari, and during my time there, we were trying to cope with the fact that we'd already completely saturated the market with games. I mean, they were everywhere, um, not just arcades, but convenience stores and supermarkets as well. Uh, operators stopped buying them. Uh, sales dropped by a factor of five or so, and we had mass layoffs. And I ended up leaving Sega in 1985, excuse me, leaving Atari in 1985 to join Sega. And by the next year, I moved to Japan and started making console games with their team in Tokyo. Now, Sega was trying to break into a market that had first been dominated by Atari and now was being dominated by Nintendo. They'd had moderate success with their 4-bit home console and were now in the process of releasing an 8-bit console called the Sega Master System. And one sign of the times was that there were essentially no third parties. A few titles were made by our one software collaborator that was a company called Sunsoft. But other than that, the entire lineup for the master system was being created by a 40-person internal team. And we were busy. The typical title was created by just two people, a programmer and an artist, in just three months. Almost none of the Sega talent spoke English. And I ended up learning quite good Japanese simply as a matter of survival. Now, the president of the company at the time had a, a fairly odd philosophy. He felt as if title quality was more important than title quality. In other words, the NES, which was the Nintendo console at the time, had 80 games for it. The uh, Sega Master System had 40 games for it. And he felt that the path to success was to make our software lineup larger than Nintendo's. And that turned out about as poorly as you can imagine. In the United States, we ended up with a 4% market share to Nintendo's 94%. In fact, none of the games we created were truly successful until the president changed his philosophy and put five times the usual resource into just one title. Uh, and that was, of course, Sonic the Hedgehog, which was Sega's first million seller. Now, after seven years with Sega, I joined a startup called Crystal Dynamics. I was the first member of the first game team. And one of the main reasons I joined was that they would be doing very early development for a console called the 3DO Multiplayer, which we all thought would be the console that made 3D graphics possible. And to be clear, when I say 3D graphics, I just mean the graphics in a modern video game, like an FPS or an adventure game. Because in 1992, when I joined Crystal Dynamics, virtually all console games were side-scrollers or had top-down views or the like. And Crystal was an incredible place to work. We had a lot of fun. And at the same time, uh, at least in the early years of the company, we just weren't that good at making the games. We had Sega's bad habit of valuing title quantity over title, title quality, and we'd learned all the wrong lessons from electronic arts. We created massive technical design documents and game design documents that were ultimately meaningless. And to be honest, I mean, at the time too, I too believed that massive design documents and detailed schedules were part of the proper and efficient way to make games. But I did start to notice that these documents wouldn't even last a month without needing to be rewritten. It, it appeared to me as if certain aspects of the process of game creation were simply unschedulable and untrackable. And I began to wonder if there wasn't a better way to make games. Now, perhaps the biggest impact of my time at Crystal Dynamics was that I finally had a chance to write a real-time graphics engine. And being an engine programmer for the first time uh, was definitely a learning experience. Uh, unfortunately, one of the first things I learned was that the 3DO hardware was simply too underpowered to provide much of a gaming experience, whether it was 2D or 3D. It was quite disappointing. Now, at this time, we started hearing about a more advanced console in its early prototype stage. It was called the PlayStation. Sony Computer Entertainment didn't have much of an organization in the U.S. at that time. So on um, one trip to Japan, I went to Sony Computer Entertainment headquarters in Tokyo to see if I could get a dev kit. And I was told, no, they're available only to Japanese licensees. English language contracts ha haven't even been created yet. So 
I said, that's fine. Just think of Crystal Dynamics as a Japanese licensee. And I signed the Japanese contract. And amazingly, they sent us over a dev kit. I believe it was the first one that any US company had ever received. And though I didn't know it at the time, we received that dev kit because a man in the business development group named Shuhei Yoshida saw me come in and thought, hmm, this Martin guy might be going somewhere. And though it was very much against the rules, Shu approved that dev kit. Now, I never got a chance to use that dev kit because in 1994, I got a very big break. Um, Universal Studios, which was one of the major entertainment conglomerates, had decided to enter the cutting edge world of multimedia. And they, they weren't really sure what multimedia was. Uh, they, they noticed that Myst and The Seventh Guest had been selling very well, and they wanted to be sure that they weren't left behind. As a result, I was recruited to help start up their interactive entertainment group, which was called, simply enough, Universal Interactive Studios. I was initially vice president of product development and later ended up president of the company. Now, the best part of this was that Universal didn't really know the business. And as a result, I had a great big bag of money and no supervision whatsoever. My belief was that multimedia was just video games by another name, so I focused on creating titles for PlayStation. And I was finally able to set the principles under which game creation would occur. I focused on game quality over game quality, and I threw out those lengthy game design documents and technical design documents. And it's, it's hard to believe that start to finish, my time at Universal Studios was just four years. I was a producer and executive producer for the first time, uh, and I started by searching the for the, uh, for the talent that would make our studio a success. We ended up signing a three-person development company called Naughty Dog, and the result was Crash Bandicoot. We signed a two-person startup called Insomniac Games that had no prior experience whatsoever, uh, and the result was Spyro the Dragon. And part of the reason behind our success was that we were able to spend two or three million dollars a title, which, believe it or not, in those days would ensure the highest possible production value. And we also benefited from a streamlined approach. We'd write a, a four-page concept and just dive right into the game development. We, we didn't try to overly plan the initial stages of game creation. Altogether, all the, uh, the titles we created in those first years went on to sell over 20 million units. Now, these were PlayStation titles, and as such, we didn't have um, much of a sales and marketing organization of our own. Uh, we ended up licensing uh, distribution rights to Sony Computer Entertainment, and Ken Kutaragi hand-picked the producer who would work on us for Crash Bandicoot, which, let me tell you, made me quite uh, a bit nervous. Uh, but as an amazing coincidence, it turned out that the producer was Shuhei Yoshida. So Shu, who had sent me that first dev kit in the US because he thought I might be able to do something exciting with it, was indeed correct because Crash Bandicoot became the top-selling brand for PlayStation. But Shu did have a lot to do with that himself. We, we never would have been a hit title in Japan without his guidance. One other uh, fun note from these early years is that there was a group of us, I always thought of the, as the, uh, the Three Musketeers. Uh, in 1998 or so, Shu was heading up product development in Japan. Andy House was head of marketing for Sony Computer Entertainment America. I was producer on the titles. And we, the three of us were almost exactly the same age. We were born within a year of each other. And we must have been just 34 or 35 at the time, which seems incredibly young when I look back at it now. So when their contracts expired, um, Naughty Dog and Insomniac decided to work directly with Sony Computer Entertainment. And I had a difficult decision to make. Should I follow them? Or should I stay on as president of Universal Interactive Studios and rebuild? And it, it was a tough decision, but I, I chose to leave Universal Studios and continue working with those talented developers. So in, in 1998, I founded Cerny Games and have now spent the last 15 years working as a consultant, not just with Naughty Dog and Insomniac, but also uh, a number of other companies within the PlayStation universe. Now, we've had um, a busy four years with Crash Bandicoot and Spyro the Dragon, but Ken Kuduragi had also been busy. He took the, the success of the first PlayStation as an opportunity to bring his vision for console hardware to a whole new level. And by early um, 1999, working prototypes had been completed of the PlayStation 2. And a team of programmers was hard at work in a locked room in Tokyo, creating the demo programs that would be used in the springtime launch of the hardware. Now, Shu Yoshida, his name is going to come up a lot here today, uh, contacted me. He'd heard that the hardware was much more powerful, but that many were struggling with its complexity. 
and he wanted to make sure that Naughty Dog and Insomniac, who would be creating early titles for PlayStation 2, got off to as fast a start as possible. So he extended an invitation to me. I could enter that locked room. I could sit alongside the demo team, and I could work on a graphics engine for PlayStation 2. And I ended up living in uh, Tokyo for three months as the first American to get his hands on the system, and did indeed create a game engine that became a reference point for the early engine work of those two developers. And Shu was right about its complexity. Uh, it was a lot more time consuming to get going on PlayStation 2 uh, than it was on PlayStation 1. Uh, I think of hardware complexity in terms of, of time to triangle, by which I, I don't mean the time to create a program that displays one triangle. One triangle, that's trivial. I mean the time to create an engine that comes close to what the hardware is theoretically capable of in terms of triangle count. Now, for PlayStation 1, Time to triangle was just a month or two. All you had to do was call some library functions. But for PlayStation 2, it took something like half a year as the programmers had to learn to write efficient assembly code for the vector units. These were uh, embedded graphics processors created specifically for the PlayStation 2. In a sense, this was our first wake-up call. Thanks to the much higher performance of the PlayStation 2, game developers were able to radically increase the richness of the content that they were creating. Something like the uh, world of Jack and Daxter simply wouldn't have been possible on any previous hardware. But that richness came at a cost. Each, each um, game developer now needed a team of talented professionals who would do nothing other than write that low-level graphics code. And there was a loss of flexibility, too. If the creative director had some new idea where to take the game, a lot of that low-level graphics code would need to be scrapped and rewritten. In the end, despite all of that, it turned out very well. Uh, for Sony Computer Entertainment, PlayStation 2 is by many measures the most successful console in the history of video games. And I had a great time. I spent a focused four years creating games for the platform, focusing primarily on uh, engine technology for Jack and Daxter and game design for Ratchet and Clank. Now, it's hard to imagine, but in those years, um, we were just on a five-year hardware cycle. Uh, meaning just five years between one generation of consoles and the next. So my time on PlayStation 2 was pretty brief. In 2003, I was working on just the second game in each of those series when Shuhei Yoshida came by with an, an, an idea. Shu Yoshida was now head of Sony Computer Entertainment America product development. So all of the U.S. game teams reported to him, and he had concerns. Some of his concerns were about cost. There were many good game teams in the States, but they were all working independently, and the, uh, the size of the typical team had tripled over the last years. Shu wondered if collaboration and technology sharing could reduce the cost of game development, or at least slow its rise. He also had concerns, which turned out to be justified, that the next platform transition might be even trickier than the last, and he wanted to be sure that Sony Computer Entertainment America was up to the challenge of PlayStation 3. So we ended up forming a, uh, a specialized technology group whose function was to spearhead SCEA's entry into the next generation. Uh, Shu thought that Naughty Dog might be um, a good base of operations, and after some conversations with the founders, Jason Rubin and Andy Gavin, we decided to free up some people from work on the Jack and Daxter sequel and uh, uh, use them as a base from which to grow the tech team. And we ended up uh, naming the group the ICE Team, which initially stood for the initiative for a common engine. Its goal was to investigate advanced graphics and other technologies and to build and disseminate various early systems um, that could be used as games began their, um, as the teams began their preliminary next generation game development. Shu's hope was that as the PlayStation 3 generation progressed, uh, we'd then continue to foster inter-team collaboration and thereby increase both the quality of the titles and reduce their development costs. Now, even though we knew nothing about PlayStation 3 at the time, we suspected that the transition from PS2 to PS3 would be challenging. Uh, we could tell by looking at the PC graphics world that a revolution of sorts had occurred. Uh, something called programmable shading was now possible. And what this meant was that a program could be run on any, every pixel of the game scenes, which opened up a lot of potential, uh, but also meant that our approach to graphics needed to be scrapped and rewritten. So uh, we on the ICE team definitely had a lot to study up on. There was another part to Shu Yoshida's plan as well. On PS1 and PS2, the hardware team had worked in complete isolation. They conceptualized the design, they laid out the circuitry, they built prototypes, they wrote documentation. And when the hardware was complete, 
they would pass that documentation off to developer support, who would brief the teams. There was essentially no communication whatsoever between the hardware team and the game teams. For PlayStation 3, uh, Shu Yoshida had amazingly gotten approval to embed ICE team members with the hardware team in Tokyo, meaning that we would sit side by side with them as the hardware was being designed and learn the details of what was being created. The idea was that by breaking down this barrier between game and hardware teams, we could, would be able to start our game development work at least a year earlier. And as for who would join that hardware team, uh, Shu's first choice was me. I was bilingual, working with a number of the game teams already, and I'd done something similar for PlayStation 2. So in the late summer of 2003, I went to Tokyo and entered the Sanctum Sanctorum, uh, the top secret facility where the future of Sony computer entertainment was being planned. And my big surprise was that the hardware team was a, a half dozen engineers in a mid-sized room in one of the many Sony buildings. I, I mean, I'd, I guess I'd expected something from a James Bond movie or maybe uh, an elite high-tech facility of sorts, but that was the first lesson for me. These kinds of projects are driven by just a few, uh, few people with a vision, and all they need to do the basic hardware design work is desktop PCs. Now, at that time, the design of Cell was done, and the hardware team was hard at work on the graphics processor that would complete the system. So the hardware team leader uh, said to me, Mark, um, here's documentation on Cell, here's a simulator, let us know what you think you can do with it. And it turns out this was a bit of a test. Uh, I'll get to that in a minute. At any rate, Cell was Ken Kutaragi's brainchild, and the SPUs in Cell are like a supercomputer on a chip. They have high performance, but to get that performance, you have to master their very high complexity. What you need to do is, is pick a small objective, maybe just an, uh, a single short loop that does uh, some fairly simple processing. Then you break it down into various sub-operations. -oper and finally, you need to solve a puzzle, how to optimally perform those sub-operations on the hardware. If you can do it, the result is tremendous uh, performance. But as a programmer, it's kind of like solving a Rubik's Cube. And it's pretty much like that the first hundred times you sit down to write a program. In other words, the SPUs had huge potential, larger than any conventional CPU, but a correspondingly huge effort was required to unlock that potential. Now, this was, um, as I said, a test of sorts. The, the hardware team had to compare the overhead of having me around with the possible benefits that come with increased understanding of how the hardware will actually be used in game projects. And at the end of the month, uh, that first month, they had me give a, a formalized presentation showing what I'd, be, what I'd been able to accomplish with the SPUs. I had a number of programs working. I'd made quite good progress on understanding how to use the SPUs, and I think I even managed to surprise the hardware team a little bit. So you could say I passed the test. I also really enjoyed that month, too. I, I love puzzles. But, and I'm, I'm ashamed to say this, I wasn't thinking about the practical reality of making a game using SPUs. And I never imagined that the cost of cell would be one of the, one of the factors that caused PlayStation 3 to ship at a price of $599. I was just staying focused on the task at hand, which is trying to figure out how best to use the chip that had already been designed. Now, my reward for passing the test is that when I came to work the next day, there was another manual sitting on my desk. It described the details of the GPU that the hardware team was in the process of designing. And this was the start of a long collaboration between the hardware team and the ICE team. Uh, basically, I and a few others would shuttle back and forth between the US and Japan. When in Tokyo, we'd learn about the hardware being built and try writing code for it in emulation to test our understanding. When in the US, I'd work with the other ICE team members to design a software architecture that could be used in the first party games. And this was an exciting time, but it was also a scary time. It was exciting because the technology was so new, and if used properly, it was so powerful. It was scary because it was hard to figure out how to do the most basic tasks on the hardware. At any rate, after a year or so of this, at which point our little team had grown to more than a dozen programmers, we started to have confidence that we'd done it. We'd cracked the code, we'd solved the puzzle, we'd figured out how to make games on the hardware. We were happy. We were happy because it was now, there was now the potential uh, for some fantastic titles to come out of first-party teams in the US. And we were also happy because we had a tremendous lead over every third-party team that would try to make games for the platform. The third parties hadn't been even briefed yet, let alone uh, started work on their PlayStation 3 engines. Our feeling 
was that electronic arts and rock star better watch out. Our proprietary first party systems were going to show them who just, sorry, show them who had the right stuff. Now, this was, of course, completely the wrong attitude. But at the time, we just didn't know any better. We were all working on behalf of Sony Computer Entertainment's US game teams, and we were just thinking about our individual game titles. We weren't thinking about the platform at all. So by this time, it was already early 2005, and the hardware launch was set for holiday 2006, less than two years away. Our focus changed from creating shared technology to trying to develop launch and launch window titles. And we had had to come face to face with a very tough fact. It was going to be quite difficult to create those titles. One problem that surfaced at this point was that the emphasis had been, um, for those first few years, 99% hardware and 1% software. PS3 hardware was now close to a reality, but uh, the game teams lacked many of the tools necessary to create their titles. There was no quality debugger for the SPUs. There were no GPU debug or performance analysis tools. There was no level graphics uh, driver. The entire development environment was in a very primitive state. The first party teams were having a hard time of it, but the third party teams, without the luxury of just being able to focus on PlayStation 3, um, and without the benefit of our early start, were having an even more difficult time of it. Another problem was that Time to Triangle had taken an enormous leap. Um, the teams that I worked with in the first party needed basically an entire year to create usable graphics engines. The sky-high expectations for the game titles could only be met through uh, clever use of SPUs, but both the unique nature of Cell and the primitive state of the development environment meant that game creation on PlayStation 3 was more time-consuming than any previous platform. Now, fortuitously, uh, due to the more open nature of the PS3 development process, the various tech teams, such as the ICE team, were already fully briefed on the hardware and, in fact, had quite a bit of experience with it. So these teams um, had the knowledge and resources to start independently creating various tools and technologies to make PS3 game development easier. And we'd also finally uh, and collectively figured out that third parties were essential for the platform's success. So though up to that date the focus had been on proprietary first party tools, now there was a complete turnaround in attitude and the question became how quickly and to what degree we could expose our formerly proprietary systems to third parties. So um, in late 2005, the various game studios in Japan, US, and Europe uh, were merged to form the worldwide studio. And one of our first acts was to figure out which first party teams had the strongest tools and technologies and how best to share those tools and technologies with the Worldwide Studios software competitors. So PlayStation 3 did ultimately launch in 2006. And though we couldn't address all these issues in time for launch, which resulted in a weak lineup, uh, we came out of this difficult time with some strengths. Those, those three years around launch, 2005, 2006, 2007, are our unifying experience at Sony Computer Entertainment. Anyone who lived through those times understands the, the need for international collaboration, the value of frank and open conversation, the franker the better, we're all in this together, the importance not just of hardware, but also software and tools, and the vital role of third parties in the success of the platform. Conversations that would, would have been impossible to have in 2004 were just an everyday way of doing business by 2008. So, after PlayStation 3 shipped, the hardware team immediately started working on reducing the manufacturing cost of the console. And in 2007, they also began a post-mortem analysis of PlayStation 3, what had worked and what hadn't, with the goal of beginning to determine the basic direction to take with the next console. In other words, this was the initial step in the creation of PlayStation 4. And for the first time in Sony Computer Entertainment's history, this process was inclusive and collaborative. The ICE team and other tools and technology teams were invited to participate. Now, the most obvious path forward was to continue to use Cell. Uh, though the learning curve had been steep, it was clear that mastery of SPUs was leading to some amazing titles like Uncharted Drake's Fortune. So it was definitely an option to continue using Cell, uh, perhaps even enhancing it to making it uh, more powerful or easier to use. But there were other options too. Uh, we could move to a more conventional architecture with just a CPU and a GPU. If we went with that approach, choosing a CPU would be a very big deal because that would determine which vendor we worked with and thereby determine pretty much every aspect of our project. Timeline, business structure, development cost, and the like. So there were 
two main possibilities for CPU. Uh, the power PC architecture that we used in PlayStation 3 and Cell, and the x86 architecture used in pretty much every modern PC. And the conventional wisdom, as expressed by a number of the first party game programmers, was that the x86 architecture was unusable in a games console. And I took this very seriously. A console needs to be competitive with a much more powerful PC. And if game programmers need the more straightforward power PC architecture to make that happen, I understand. I just wondered if this was true. Uh, because the potential design space of PlayStation 4 was going to be pretty limited if we couldn't use the x86 CPU. So I spent my November holiday in 2007 researching the 30-something year history of the x86 all the way uh, from its creation in the 1970s up through the most recent enhancements. And my conclusion was that the conventional wisdom had been correct, but progressive enhancements by Intel and AMD had finally resulted in something that the console programmers could embrace. And, and then I started thinking. I just sacrificed my holiday to in investigate some philosophical point for a console that I'm not really assigned to be working on that won't be released for five years. That's, that, that's passion. That's enthusiasm. Maybe I should consider working on this project more deeply. And then I started thinking about my skill set. I'd, I'd been a designer and a generalist programmer when I was making games at Atari. I'd become fluent in Japanese through my years at Sega. I'd programmed graphics engines at Crystal Dynamics. I'd worked as a producer, an executive producer in my time at, at Universal Studios. And I was certainly willing and able to travel. And I began to believe that I had the experience and necessary expertise to make a larger contribution. Because whoever led that next generation effort was going to need to have most of those skills. That person needed to be deeply technical, like an engine programmer. But at, that, at the same time, that person would need to understand the larger process of creating games, like a producer. And given the Japanese nature of the company and the broad geographical distribution of the various technology teams, it was going to be necessary to be bilingual and ready to travel as well. And so I, I knew it was a bit audacious, but I went to Shu Yoshida and I pitched him on the idea that I would be lead architect on PlayStation 4. And I asked him if he thought this would be possible. And to my amazement, Shu said yes. So I went to the World Wide Studios head at that time, who also agreed. So I went to Masa Chitani, who was head of, uh, he was the uh, CTO of Sony Computer Entertainment at the time. And uh, to my amazement, Masa agreed. He said yes, but. I would have to leave the worldwide studio and work through Sony Computer Entertainment headquarters instead, because that, of course, is where the hardware project would be located. Now, when I say leave the worldwide studio, I wasn't really leaving them because I'd never been a member. I'd been consulting on over a dozen worldwide studios game projects as Cerny Games. And when I started working with Sony Computer Entertainment headquarters, that was once again as a consultant, meaning that I had no formal responsibility whatsoever because I was not part of company management. I was not even a company employee. So if, if you contrast my position with that of Ken Kutaragi, who was both chairman of Sony Computer Entertainment and the hardware visionary, he had complete responsibility, not just for the hardware, but for all aspects of the company. But I think in the long run, my lack of formal status has had, had um, great benefit, both to me and to SCE. As a consultant, um, I manage no employees. I'm not respo responsive, uh, excuse me, I'm not responsible for budgets. I don't give presentations to other divisions of Sony. Uh, I don't track progress versus milestones. I don't negotiate contracts. I'm free to think about where we need to be in five years and work with the appropriate groups inside and outside of the company to make that happen. So in some ways, uh, it's a bit like being a director on a game title. I and mean, certainly there are many programmers and artists and designers on the title, but they report to managers, not to the director. And there's also a budget that has to be tracked when you make a game, but that's managed by the producer, not by the director. The director's role is to shape the shared vision and communicate it to the team. At any rate, in early 2008, the development of PlayStation 4 began in earnest, and we followed the new principles. Uh, the chief architect was an American. That's pretty international. We immediately began frank and open conversations with some of the game teams, and we kicked off the software and the tools effort pretty much simultaneously with the hardware. Involving the third parties was tricky, though. Uh, we definitely wanted their input on the design, but we felt it would be a bad idea to go to the teams who were making the top PlayStation 3 titles in 2008 or 2009 and start briefing them on a system that wouldn't be released for many years. It just felt like a tremendous distraction. So our solution 
was to make a questionnaire and present it to the third party teams. We simply asked a, a lot of questions about the future of consoles and computer graphics and what they would like to see in a next generation console. Some of these questions were about CPU count, CPU types, GPU types, bandwidth, and the answers were predictable. Basically, the team said that if we can afford to give them 1,000 times the performance of the PlayStation 3, go ahead, do it. But more importantly, we asked them about the flavor of the systems, uh, the, the flavor of those systems that they would like to see in that next generation game console, and the ratios behind the uh, between the various components. Should we put more money into the CPU or the GPU or somewhere else? So we got great feedback, but they weren't fooled for a minute by the abstract nature of this questionnaire. Everyone we sat down with, and we sat down with a lot of teams, knew that we were asking for their feedback on the design of PlayStation 4. And I ended up talking to more than 30 teams in uh, the US, Europe, and Japan. And I'm very glad I did so, because the answers we, we got were not what I thought that they would be. Turned out, uh, the number one piece of feedback was that they wanted a system with unified memory. So that means just one pool of high-speed memory, not the two that are found on PC or on PlayStation 3. We also learned that the proper CPU count was four or eight, and that if we had the money to spend, uh, we should invest it in a very powerful GPU. And the final piece of feedback we received was that they didn't want Exotica. If there was, for example, a GPU out there that could do real-time ray tracing, they did not want it in PlayStation 4. I mean, certainly that would be fascinating technology, but it would require game teams to take several years, throw out all their existing graphics technology, and rebuild it from scratch to use that uh, exotic GPU. There were uh, a few other milestones worthy of note in 2008. Uh, Shu Yoshida became the new head of the Worldwide Studio and assumed responsibility for all game titles being created at Sony Computer Entertainment. And Ken Kutaragi received the Lifetime Achievement Award from the Akimat, excuse me, Academy of Interactive Arts and Sciences. I presented it to him at the ceremony. And I, I'd like to say that this is him passing the torch to me, but actually that picture is me handing him the incredibly heavy trophy at the awards dinner. So though Ken Kutaragi had largely left Sony by that point, we did think from time to time about what Ken would do if he was designing PlayStation 4. It's tough, though. Ken is a true genius. I mean, I remember at one time during the development of PlayStation 3, around 2004 or so, um, I was talking about triangle counts, at which point Ken said in no uncertain terms that anyone who talks about triangle counts is misguided. He'd just been to see one of the Lord of the Rings movies again. And his point was that we should be thinking about how to replicate the visuals of those movies. How do we display 70,000 screaming orcs in real time with great visual fidelity? And we should not be thinking about micro issues like the triangle count that the hardware can support. So I'm not Ken, though. So I, I took a simpler approach. In some ways, um, it was like Nolan Bushnell's famous philosophy for designing arcade games. He said that they should be easy to learn, but difficult to master. By that, he meant that anyone should be able to put a quarter into that arcade meeting, uh, arcade machine and uh, have fun playing it immediately, but that there needed to be enough depth to the game that it would take months for the players to fully develop their skills and to master it. So my variation on this was that the hardware should have um, a familiar architecture and be easy to develop for in the early days of the console life cycle, but that also there needed to be a rich feature set which the game creators could explore for years. To put a more specific timeline on that, perhaps some solid features for year one and some very additional, uh, interesting additional features, perhaps more speculative for year three or year four of the console lifetime. Another way to express this was that we didn't want the hardware to be a puzzle that the developers would need to solve in order to make quality titles. And just to give a, a specific example, this gets technical very quickly, please forgive me. The architecture that we ended up for PlayStation 4 uh, uses a 256-bit bus and a type of memory found in top-of-the-line graphics cards called GDDR5. And the combination of this wide bus and this fast memory gives us 176 gigabytes per second, which, and many of you will have to take my word for it, is quite a lot. So with that much bandwidth, straightforward programming techniques usually result in some pretty impressive graphics. Now, we knew that there was an alternative architecture that would be a bit easier to manufacture. 
In this architecture, we would use a narrower 128-bit bus, which would drop the bandwidth down to 88 gigabytes per second, which is not particularly good in next-generation terms and therefore would really hurt the graphic performance. So we then used some very fast on-chip memory to bring the performance back up. If we used eDRAM for this on-chip memory, we knew that bandwidths of as much as one terabyte per second, that's 1,000 gigabytes per second, would be achievable. The catch, though, is that the on-chip memory would need to be very small, and each game team would need to develop special techniques in order to manage it. So to compare these two architectures, uh, the one on the left has 176 gigabytes per second for any access. The one on the right has 88 gigabytes per second if the data is in system memory or 1,000 gigabytes per second if the data is in that tiny EDRAM. And at first, architecture, uh, at first glance, the architecture on the right looks far superior to the one on the left. Uh, sure, it takes a while to figure out how to use it, but once you understand how to use that little cache of EDRAM, you can unlock the full potential of the hardware. But to our new way of thinking, the straightforward approach on the left is definitely advantageous. It gives us um, excellent day one performance, and we can find other features for the programmers to explore in later years. So in other words, it may be counterintuitive, but 176 is much larger than 1,088. So here you can see the impact that the straightforward and familiar architecture of PlayStation 4 has had on Time to Triangle. It's basically back to where it was on PlayStation 1. Uh, it's great to be able to leverage the fact that almost all third-party teams already have a sophisticated graphics engine that runs on PCs. And the familiar architecture has also been of great benefit to indie developers. Not, not only are titles much easier to bring to PlayStation 4, but conceptually driven titles can be created on PlayStation 4 without any significant time spent on studying the tech details of the platform. Now, as I said earlier, we've also worked hard to ensure that the console has a rich feature set, which will allow it to grow over the years and support the overall evolution of gaming. And our work there on that rich feature set focused on making sure that for those teams that were interested in investing the time, the GPU could be used for far more than conventional graphics. Principally, we enhanced the GPU to make the use of asynchronous fine-grained compute practical on the platform. So the asynchronous refers to how the GPU will, not be, will be uh, doing many tasks not directly related to graphics. Physics simulation, collision detection, ray casting for audio, decompression, and the like. And these operations are fine-grained, meaning that there will, there will be many small world simulation tasks running on the GPU simultaneously, alongside rendering of the game scenes. So the concept is that as game developers learn to use these techniques later on in the console lifecycle, we'll see richer and even more interactive worlds. Of course, um, there's a lot more that goes into a game console than just the CPU, the GPU, and the system memory. There are uh, a great net number of decisions that need to be made regarding hardware, uh, system software, and the larger user experience that surrounds the games. Part of our strategy for reconciling the many differing opinions in these areas has been to adopt a fundamentally developer-driven process. What that means uh, is that when there are important decisions that need to be made, we run them by our collaborators in first and third party. Uh, even when opinions seem unanimous internally, I still tend to give presentations to the game teams explaining the rationale for the decisions we're making. Now, I'm sure you're hearing this and you're thinking that talking to developers and listening to their feedback sounds pretty simple, but the truth is it's, it's quite a bit more complex than that. Uh, the first reason is that the people you want to be talking to are the best of the best. The lead engineers at world-class companies such as U uh, EA, Ubisoft, Rockstar, Activision, Capcom, and the like. And in order to be able to have sustained conversations with these busy people, you have to demonstrate that your technical understanding is of a comparable level to theirs. So part of our strategy here was to prepare extraordinarily detailed presentations. That's where we show our, our passion for technology and our expertise. And doing all of that preparation also helps address another issue, which is that you don't ever want to be in a position of not being able to answer a question. Then you need to get on the road with your 500 PowerPoint slides and do that eight-hour presentation for the developers, which I've done, for example, uh, in the summer, in Tokyo, in Japanese, in a room with no air conditioning, standing up and holding a heavy microphone. Uh, your whole body aches the next day. And then you have to be prepared for any reaction at all. I wasn't there for the famous meeting when one of our developers said, um, if the PlayStation 4 doesn't have eight gigabytes of memory, then Sony is dead. 
but I have flown thousands of miles to get booed by the audience in the middle of a presentation. It's tough, but it's, it's eye-opening too. That is the sort of passion that lets us know when we're on the wrong track and need to come up uh, with a new direction. So the payoff is huge for doing things this way. Just to give one example, the hard drive in every PlayStation 4 is great for downloaded content, but more specifically what it's doing is enabling the developer dream of living software, where every time you return to the game, there's, uh, there's something new to experience, new places in the world to explore, new missions, and so on. Without actively and continuously soliciting developer feedback, we'd never have understood where the game creators will be taking their titles in the next decade. So I'd like to leave you with a few thoughts. The, the first is that if you want to know where I'll be doing, excuse me, what I'll be doing in five years' time, don't ask me. Ask Shu Yoshida. It's all part of his master plan. Uh, the reason there's a game developer deep within the hardware team is that Shu had the patience and the foresight to make it happen. And finally, uh, the Three Musketeers are back. Um, Andrew House was appointed president of SCE in 2011. And one of the small results of that, but, but huge for me, was that it provided a, a further boost to the engagement, uh, the policies of engagement with game developers around the world. I have a, a great friend who lives in Kyoto, in the eastern part of Japan. He runs a develop there, developer there, and, and he's worked with both Sony Computer Entertainment and um, uh, Nintendo over the years. And he says that what he respects the most about Nintendo is the incredible continuity that they have in the form of a core group of individuals that has now worked together for over 30 years. Well, we on the PlayStation side of the business have only about 20 years together now, but I'm really forward, looking forward to the uh, next decade or two with Shu, Andy, and the other amazing talents of Sony Computer Entertainment. And I think by the end of it, we'll even have my friend in Kyoto telling everyone how our values held strongly over a great period of time, had such an influence over the world of games. And that's it for the presentation. Thank you so much for your time today.